What is a seemingly mundane question you can ask somebody that will tell you a lot about their personality? This seems like a great prompt for if therapists, people interviewing for new jobs, or just someone going on a first date. I'm pretty curious to see how much psychoanalysis can actually be done from just a single question. Let's see what creative ways people have devised to hack into other people's brains. Story 1. What was the last thing you did that gave you childlike joy? My 14-year-old asked for a longboard last spring. I'd said no before because I figured it'd be something I'd spend a few hundred bucks on that she'd try once, not be good at right away, and never touch it again. It wouldn't be the first time. After being locked up for two months with quarantine, I figured, hmm, why not? It gets her outside and maybe something she'll enjoy. At that point, I just wanted to get her out of her room and off her phone. I'd never seen her work so hard at something she wasn't good at right away. After two back-to-back six-hour days of practice, she started to get the hang of it and asked me if I wanted to try. I couldn't even stand on a board when I was a kid, but as an adult, I just hmm, got it. I wasn't on it for five minutes, and I said, I need one. We left right then and picked one up for myself. We cruised all spring, summer, and fall. Not only was it great for bonding, I hadn't felt that kind of joy since I was little. A moment I'll never forget. Can't wait for the snow to melt. Oh my gosh, this is awesome. First, I'm impressed that she practiced for so many hours. Second, I love that you got it and wanted to go get one so you could do it together. And I said, I need one. More like, get your own, Dad. You've been hogging it all day. This sounds so stupid to type out, but dancing. Like actually dancing by myself in the mirror. Feeling the beat and just being silly. Super therapeutic. 10 out of 10 would recommend to just let loose. I, uh, I found this old pair of stick-on nails with little cats that had googly eyes, so I got my sister to help me put them on with the help of some nail glue. Listen to Rainbow Connection by Kermit the Frog on Spotify last Friday. Just reading this gave me joy. Does playing with my son count? He's a child who frequently exhibits childlike joy, of which I am a symbiotic parasite. That seems kind of like cheating at this question. Story 2. My father-in-law went to a job interview about 10 years ago and absolutely nailed the interview. As he was being shown around the office, a high-level person in the company, who normally wasn't there, just happened to be there that day. After they were introduced, he asked my father-in-law what kind of animal he would be. My father-in-law said he panicked and picked the bear. He's a bigger guy. And the other guy said something along the lines of, That's a little aggressive. Maybe this isn't the job for you. So he didn't get the job, but I guess it worked out because he's got a pretty good job now, and if I was him, I wouldn't want to work for someone who hires people based on what animal they think they would be. Well, that sounds like an awful place to work. If a company would kick you out for everything good but one minor choice, I don't think working there will be happy. Good bosses know the strengths and weaknesses of their colleagues, and one failure does not necessarily mean bad. The right answer was... I'd be a parasite that lives in your eye and eats away your optical nerves. Oh, you sound like you'd be good in management. The guy should have asked the follow-up question, why did you choose the bear? Because a bear is not always associated with an aggressive animal, but can also be associated with a tough-looking guy who really loves cuddles and is a sweetheart. The explanation says more about the person than a one-worded answer. This actually applies to a lot of answers. Wow, that is so messed up. That guy's a poo head. I bet the asker picked the bear himself and didn't want two bears in the same office. Yeah, that's a lame way to try to hire someone. I have a hard time thinking of any animal that is one-dimensional, so no matter what answer the father-in-law gave, it wouldn't really give any insight into his character since any single given animal can be characterized in a variety of vastly different ways. Like, for instance... I'm an admirer of sheep, and sometimes they are portrayed as followers, like when people say, wake up, sheeple, but um, that's because they're envisioning domesticated sheep. In the wilds, if you picture a bighorn ram, they are independent and stand their own ground, so you can't really generalize or stereotype animals into one category. Story 3. What's your favorite dinosaur? In my last year of college, I took a prehistoric history class and loved it. 
I, a history major, commuted by light rail to school and would end up spending the hour or so on the train congregating with other history majors. One day I asked this group, what's your favorite dinosaur? Most of the people gave answers like velociraptors or that they hadn't really been interested in dinosaurs since they were kids, which was fair enough. But one guy said, I don't believe in dinosaurs and that the earth was 6,000 years old. This was a guy that was studying history for the sake of teaching children history, and he was denying that most of the Earth's history didn't exist, despite learning otherwise in the classes he was specializing in. I lost a lot of respect for him that day, and now having a favorite dinosaur is a barometer test of mine. Triceratops. I saw this coming, just recently learned that not believing in dinosaurs is an actual conspiracy theory that is commonly held. It reminds me of the first time I heard of the flat earth theory. I was in training on a job at a tech firm. In our orientation, we have to tell someone about something exciting we did. I go with a generic skydiving story, and he busts out, did you see the curve? I was kind of dumbfounded, because the earth is gigantic, and I said, no. The next ten minutes were him explaining how the earth was flat. I couldn't believe it was a thing. Yet, for the next year, I looked up everything I could find to try and validate how someone could believe it. Nope, just skepticism without serious critical thinking. He only lasted about six months in the job before he was gone. Story 4. What superpower they want. I know there are more powerful powers that could get me wealth or whatever, but man, teleportation would be dope. Can travel the world, but always sleep in your own bed and never need to book a flight. Never need to use a public restroom, easily visit family, only take road trips if I want, can live and work anywhere. The rest of life could be normal, but it'd be great. Work? <laughs> Bro, teleport in and out of the bank vaults. I love this question because this girl I knew in college had just the best answer. She said, the power to fill things. And after I looked at her kind of funny, she said, you know, like filling my bank account with money, filling my belly with spaghetti, or filling my enemies' bladders with urine. Bro, you should have married her. The power to create, change, and freely access my own personal pocket dimension. No rent, no property taxes, no carbon footprint, and you always have your entire living space with all of your stuff with you. You could be as nomadic or settled as you want, You'd never have to worry about natural or financial disasters making you homeless, and your commute to work wouldn't even exist unless you wanted it to. Distance would no longer be an obstacle between you and seeing your friends and family. The ability to change probability. You could theoretically control anything. What's the probability I'll ace this test? Make it 100%. What's the probability of me winning the lottery? 100%. What's the probability I'll finally catch Alice cheating on me? 100%. In the long run, success only matters if there is a possibility of failure. You'd eventually start forcing bad outcomes just to feel something again. And now you're a supervillain. Story 6. What would you do if you won the lottery? For me, it's a non-invasive way of listening to people's attitudes on finance in general, and also how they feel about the rich. Yes, this is a brilliant question. When I was newly dating my ex-boyfriend, it was around the time Super Lotto hit $1 billion a couple years ago. We were both in lottery ticket pools and discussed what we'd do if we won. His answer mortified me. It included how, if we were married, he'd divorce his wife and travel the world on a yacht doing drugs surrounded by hot women. Big red flag for me. Wow, of all the things that is definitely something you don't say to your girlfriend. I always say that I'd turn into an absolutely abhorrent degenerate if I were to suddenly get a cash prize like that, but in reality, I just say that because I get a laugh out of people's reactions from it. I don't even know what I'd do. Probably just quit working, find a music teacher, and play bass and video games all day long. First things first, I'm going to get a financial advisor. I'd have no idea what to do with that much money, and I don't want to end up a mess. Same here. My first thought about winning the lottery is how do you go about finding a reliable financial advisor when you've just won the lottery and everybody is suddenly offering financial advice to you? I think I read somewhere that nearly a third or so of multi-million dollar jackpot winners eventually declare bankruptcy, or sometimes they even end up worse. 
It's something of an open secret, actually, that winners of obnoxiously large jackpots, they tend to end up badly with alarming regularity. Not the $1 million winners, but more so anyone in like the seven, eight, or nine figure range. Those people are at high risk. Perhaps this is a consequence of the sample, like the demographics of lottery players might be exactly the wrong people to win large sums of money. Or perhaps money is the root of all evil. Either way, you are going to have to be careful. Story 7. In a job interview, ask your prospective supervisor how much vacation time and sick days they took last year. This is great because both extremes take pride in their answer and so will answer honestly. The no or low vacation boss is proud of how hard she or he works, but really it's bad if they don't take time off. They're coming in when they're sick, they're not recharging by taking vacation, and the expectation, even if unstated, is that their staff should follow that example. You'll feel guilty every time you call in sick or take vacation time. You want the boss who says, I always take my vacation time and encourage my staff to as well. I called in a couple times last year when I came down with a cold. Good boss. Have you ever had a negative reaction when you asked this? I can see a scenario where the prospective supervisor is a little private about this. Could it be seen as too personal of a question to ask? I'm not playing devil's advocate or advocating to not ask. I'm actually curious as someone who's hoping to be interviewing for positions in the near future. If you want to play it safe, you can ask how many days a year on average the employees here take off. Story 8. It's not a single question, but by the second or third date with a guy, I would ask him to go bowling. As it turns out, there's many ways to play the game. Do they take it too seriously and get competitive or angry if they don't do well? Does he act disinterested or bored of the game? Do they try to teach me how to play, or do they just try to be goofy and have fun with it? Do they order two pitchers of beer and get totally smashed? In my opinion, you can learn a lot about a person by the way they approach bowling. This isn't nom, this is bowling. There are rules. Donnie, you're out of your element. Story 9. One of my standard job interview questions is, tell me about something you like doing that you're good at. I don't really care what the answer is. I just want to see passion, effort, and creativity. Tell me what you're good at. Dungeons and Dragons. Okay, can you tell me a little bit more about that? Rolls the dice. No. I'm glad you asked. Pulls out campaign notes, PHB, blank character sheet, three friends, pencils, dice, mat, dry erase markers, Cheetos, and Mountain Dew. Gary, put the dice away or I'm taking them. Well, I have things I like to do, but I'm not good at any of them. I like to return shopping carts to their corral. I don't really care what the answer is. Phew, thank God for that, because my answer is going down on your mom. Story 10. What's the last thing you did for the first time? Well, now I'm having an existential crisis because I can't think of anything. Don't feel bad. It's really not the right year for that question. Mine was pee black stuff off the under rim of the toilet bowl. I just started reading the Wheel of Time series. Heck yeah. Don't give up when there's the two books that are all about the same thing, just people responding to what happens. Bought a house. Yay. Bought stocks. I read that as bought socks and spent a bit of time reflecting on how a grown adult, presumably, could exist without ever having bought socks. I came to terms with the situation and decided to move on. Then I saw that it was stocks. Story 11. Favorite question I've heard in an interview, what would you do if you came home and found a penguin in your freezer? It ends up not only being an icebreaker, but a good personality tell. Is the penguin dead or alive? African penguin or European penguin? Name him Pen Pen. Call the local zoo? What are the alternative answers? Feed it fishies? Hmm, yes, what can you do with a penguin that you find in your house? Mm, uh, aside from have it as a, a new pet, that would be the most obvious answer, I think. Everyone, everyone comes out on top of that one. Um, if you're going to be a bit darker, if you're mean and very hungry, an exotic dinner. Or you could uh, paint it like a pinata for a kid's birthday party. Um, they're already dressed in a tuxedo, so you could use them as a dance partner. Rock Hopper from Club Penguin would surely be happy with that one. A um, bit of target practice or you know, fun new display piece after a bit of home amateur taxidermy if you're a redneck. Mm, maybe some super realistic heads for fursuits if you're, if you're a furry. 
um, maybe a really ineffective disco ball <laughs> or a pen holder. I mean, you could really just hand them a pen. You don't actually have to have to end their lives for that one. Just hand them the pen. They'll hold it for you. Um, all you need is a bit of imagination, really, and you can go wild with this one. Story 12. Do you put the cart back when you're done shopping? I put my cart away, but seriously, whether someone puts their carts back really shows you what they think about rules, social norms, and whether they will follow them when someone isn't looking or judging them. It's really interesting, and it's called the shopping cart theory. Is this a real theory? As someone whose job it is to retrieve carts, I appreciate you. If they say no, walk away from this person. They are a monster. Check. No, don't just walk away. That's really rude. Be a decent person and return them to the corral. Story 13. Got this one in an interview once. How do you go about eating a muffin? Learned a lot about muffin anatomy that day. It was a bakery after all. Oh, ho, ho. I know a guy at uni that sat at his desk, naked, and just slammed his face down into him like a dog eating out of a bowl. Guy was weird AF. I knew a guy. Sure you did, naked muffin-eating man. Typical final stage teenager. Go on. How is no one addressing the nudity part of this anecdote? Story 14. What book would you like to live in? A really, really big one. Hmm, practical, I see. Wikipedia, the offline version. This is a tough one for those of us who like dystopia and historical fiction. Yep, I literally just thought to myself, well, all the books I read are nightmares. Do I pick the least terrible? Lord of the Rings, but not near Tom Bombadil. He's up to some secretly dark stuff. Hanging out with Tom Bombadil would be one of the few decent places to be in Middle Earth. Story 15. My girlfriend's dad always uses one interview question that makes or breaks a possible hire. Why are manhole covers round? The goal isn't to know the answer. It's to show that you're willing to critically think about a problem before you say you need help. Because pipes are round. Because people are roundish. Because circles possibly use less material than squares. Because they're super heavy and if they're round, then they can be rolled on their edge. Yeah, all good points, but uh, yeah, if they were square openings, it would make it harder to fit a cover on it. You'd have to, like, rotate the cover exactly the right way. Manhole covers are round, so they don't need to be rotated, and there are no corners to deal with. Also, a round manhole cover won't fall into a hole because it was rotated the wrong way, so it's safer. Story 16. What are you having for dinner tonight? It's really cool to hear about what people like, what their culture is like, because food is a huge part of that and generally just how they live. Expensive or cheap? Quick or elaborate? Adventurous or safe? Ham, mustard, maybe some baby carrots if they aren't bad yet. I might try to make that garlic bread, but it's been in the freezer for like three years now. Story 17. As a kid, what was your go-to selection from the ice cream truck? Disappointment, because we were too poor to get ice cream from the truck. The cheapest thing they offered, because my dad insisted on getting me something, even though I knew we couldn't really afford it, but it made him happy to get me a treat. Story 18. How would you describe the internet to a caveman? It will show you how they look at what the internet is used for. For example, some might say that it's a source of information, or it's a way to connect people who are far away. I know one person who said they wouldn't explain it to a caveman, because they wouldn't go back in time without AC. Hot caveman in area looking to thump. Story 19. Their favorite color, in so many ways. If they tell you without hesitating, it means they must have probably thought about it before, and it must be a color they really like, that makes them feel at home, or makes them happy. Whenever I meet someone and they tell me their favorite color, it becomes a part of them to me. I'm colorblind, and I hate this question. My favorite color is blue. Blue flower, red thorns. Hey! And then I had some rotten berries. Man, I had some strong gas seeking out of my butt that day. Story 20. If dogs wore pants, would they wear them on all four legs or just the back legs? So where I live, lots of dogs do wear pants on all four legs with buckles over the back so they don't fall. Google muddy mutts. I would argue that those aren't pants, but in fact coveralls or a jumpsuit or a onesie, depending on age, design, and material. Story 21. Are you in favor of homeowner associations? This is a good one because everyone who is familiar with them has such strong reactions. 
Yeah, I knew a guy that was a co-worker in a different department. Apparently, he was on the HOA board in his neighborhood and loved it. He was a total a-hole at work, so I knew that he terrorized his neighbors. Story 22. Does Mike Wazowski blink or wink? Hmm, depends on how he's holding his mouth. You are truly one of the great thinkers of our time. I was so confused about this question at first, I've become so used to two-eyed Mike during my time on the internet. Story 23. Oh, squirrel! Then check to see if they get excited at the prospect of a squirrel. The effectiveness of this changes drastically depending on where you are. I'm Australian, and if someone told me there was a squirrel, I would probably cry from excitement. Story 24. Alternative phrasing, how do you judge people as fast as possible? In a group setting, we had a facilitator ask, do you judge people based on what they're wearing? My friend answered, it depends on what they're wearing. It brought me joy. Throw the gavel at them. Story 25. What is the airspeed velocity of an unladen swallow? If they know, that will tell me a lot. African or European? I don't know that. How do you know so much about swallows? Well, you have to know these things when you're a king, you know. Story 26. What is a seemingly mundane question you can ask somebody that will tell you a lot about their personality? You and OP are freaking geniuses. They should go out on a date. They'll probably just keep asking this question over and over again. Story 27. Where were you the night of the red rum? Which one? I'm going to need you to be more specific. This was a good answer. That's how I'm responding every time now. Except when I'm talking to the police, of course. Story 28. Do you have the internet? Hmm, what the frick? Who told you that? No, I don't have the internet. Don't really know what that is. What is that? Some sort of chat room? Who told you that? Let's talk about something else. The only right answer. Story 29. Did I just see you digging through the trash? I didn't know we were playing Stardew Valley. Screw you, Alex. I hate you anyways. Yeah, bro. Everything in there is free. Free! They just let you take it. Story 30. I had a TA ask me in a get-to-know-you activity what my vision was for a perfect world, and I said, round. That would have been awkward if your TA was a flat earther. Story 31. Grilled cheese sandwich or a taco? Who wins in a fight? Grilled cheese, but only if it's a fair fight. If it's prison rules, I'd take the taco. Well, that's pretty racist, but correct. Story 32. Wow, coincidentally, I just had this conversation earlier today, and my friend proposed, what topic could you give a 30-minute presentation on with no preparation? I thought it was genius. Story 33. Ask them what they like to cook for breakfast. Does coffee count as cooking breakfast? Asking for a friend. A vanilla soy latte is technically a three-bean soup. Story 34. Do you prefer night or day? Night. It's calm and peaceful. I very much enjoy my alone time, and night when everyone is asleep is the best. Story 35. My coworker asked me how I was doing, and I randomly blurted out, I want to die. We've been dating for nearly two years now. Story 36. Favorite compliment they've ever received. It tells you a lot about what people think of themselves and what they tend to value. Story 37. What do you know Tim Curry from? Ooh, Fern Gully and the Rocky Horror Picture Show. I loved watching both as a kid. Oh, yes, Nigel Thornberry. Story 38. What soup they like? Vanilla soy latte. I see you made it this far down. Love the reference from the same thread. Story 39. Saving this thread for my next human interaction. I foresee much less awkward silence. Wish me luck. Story 40. What does HP stand for? Hewlett Packard? Nope, correct answer is Harry Potter. Story 41. Do you sleep with your socks on, yes or no? Story 42. You like jazz? Please leave your stories in the comments. I'd love to make a video of them in the future. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe.